there. Now, with that being said, it's time to uh, start with our reading. And our reading this morning is going to come from the book of 2 Peter, uh, chapter 1. It starts with the first verse, and it says these words. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who, through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind, and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my Lord, my rock, and my Redeemer. Amen. All right, friends, over these last handful of weeks, we have been hosting the Alpha course here at Trinity. And Alpha, as I mentioned uh, time and time again, is a wonderful opportunity to come together and talk about the really the fundamental, most basic parts of our Christian faith. Alpha is meant for people to be able to come together and explore Christianity. For folks who have questions, and maybe you've been a part of the church for a long time, or maybe you've never really come to church before, and you're not 100% sure what all these Christian people are doing. This uh, is a great opportunity. We welcome you to be a part of it. It's Wednesday nights at 5.30 downstairs in the Trinity Room. Uh, we also have a women's Bible study that's doing that on Wednesdays at 1.30 in the afternoon in rooms A and B. But uh, I have been preaching on the topics for the coming week. And this week's topic is this, this question. How can I have faith? Now, that's actually a harder question than you would think, because you could answer it in a number of ways. How can I have faith? You could look at that from the perspective of uh, what types of things would I, would I need to encounter before faith would become reasonable? And some of those things are going to be addressed in that Alpha Course time to say, well, you know, the world has some objections. They have some criticisms about our faith. There's a lot of ignorance about what we actually do claim to believe. And there are some things we claim to believe that folks, well, they may not be ready to accept. And so that's one way that you can approach a question like, how can I I believe? The other one might be operational in nature. You could say, well, what is it that I'm supposed to do in order to have faith? Because maybe faith would be a good thing, and I'm open to that, but I'm not 100% sure how to get it. Well, you know, those questions are going to be dealt with on Wednesday night. But for us today, I want to dwell on uh, an important aspect of this question. Because this is a question that we often gloss over in church because, well, we feel like we already have the answer. How can I have faith? A Christian person would probably respond with, well, how could I not have faith? I just believe. And maybe I've always believed. Or if you're like me, an adult convert, you, you remember a time when you came to faith. And, well, good. Now that part's done, right? But the truth is, is that not everybody does believe. As a matter of fact, in this world, there are many, many billions of people who don't know Jesus Christ as we know him. We believe that he's a Lord and a Savior, that he is not just a man who lived, but one who lived a sinless life, who died uh, and was crucified on the cross for our forgiveness, and that by faith and trust in his life and death and resurrection, that we experience something that we call salvation, that our life is different and better for the sake of what we believe. But the world doesn't know this. We lament certain aspects of the world that we live in today, but we don't do it, I think, in the right way. 
you know, people will point out uh, there's decline in the, the church and in faith in the world today, and that is something worth lamenting. I do uh, agree that that's true. But I also see Christians thinking about it in exactly the wrong way. You know, uh, Christianity may be in decline in some ways, and this is at least in part a demographic question. You know, there are a very large group of people called the baby boomers, boomers the largest generation that's ever lived uh, at one time, and they are starting to pass away. Now, it's always been true that people tend to cling a little bit more closely to their faith the older they get. And so we would expect that with a demographic decline like that, we'd have some decline within the church. But the real alarming thing is that the young people who are coming up in age, they're not really replacing them by faith. They're the ones who still have questions, and they haven't gotten the answers they're looking for. This is the real cause for alarm in Christianity. And you know what? You can look at the world and say, well, the world's just fallen apart, and, and isn't that the, really the problem here? But let's be honest. The folks who are outside of the church, they've never been inside of the church. So by staying out, they don't cause our decline. The decline of Christianity is happening here, inside of the church. It happens as God's people turn away as we set down the things that we used to hold so dear, and as we hold loosely the things that we used to hold on to tightly. This is a huge problem, not just for us, though certainly for us, but a, a problem for the entire world. We believe as Christian people that there's a kind of faith that saves. Now, it's important for us to remember, if we're going to ask this question, how can we have faith? Well, the first thing is, is what in the world is worth having faith in? As Christians, we don't just believe that we're saved by faith, you know. Sometimes you'll hear language like that thrown around, and, and with good intentions, a little haphazardly. You know, faith as such isn't necessarily a, a, a great thing. It isn't necessarily the most important thing. When you think about faith, everyone has faith. You've got faith, I've got faith, everyone in all the other churches have faith. All the people outside of church have faith. We don't know the answer to every question. We don't know every truth. Therefore, we have to fill in the blanks in our life with our beliefs about how the world works, what's good and what's best, what's right and what's wrong. And all of those things, and then how we live and act them out, that is what our faith is. And so when we go about our day, it doesn't matter if you believe in God or you don't, you are walking by faith. You're living out your beliefs about the world. And so faith as such, like, isn't necessarily the, the kind of great and incredible thing. As Christians, we believe that there is, though, a kind of faith that absolutely is incredible. That it is life-transforming and life-giving and life-saving. And that is faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus was God in human flesh, that he came down for our forgiveness to reconcile us so that we could love God and love each other, which is something that the world absolutely needs more of. And God has not failed to provide a way for us to have that faith. So how do we believe? Well, we, it's pretty simple. If we're going to believe in Jesus, we need to know about him. And the first witness that God gives us is the witness of Scripture, the Bible. This book, which is the ground of our faith, now, here at Trinity, uh, we believe that this Bible is true, it's correct, it's inerrant. It is given by God and inspired by God, word for word, so that God's people could come to saving knowledge of him through Jesus Christ. We believe that this word is uh, a miracle, which testifies to the truth of God through Christ, that has the power to change our lives. And God has not failed to provide us with this, uh, with this witness. And this is a wonderful gift. Though we don't always treat it as such. Most people, when they're asked, most Christian people will say, I don't read it as often as I should. I'm often amazed at how many people who are Christian have never actually read the whole thing. It is a pretty good book. But you know, there's a whole group of people who don't know what's in this book. And if God has given only one witness, only one testimony, and if it's only here within this word, those people, they have no witness. 
They have no testimony of Jesus Christ, if this is it. But there's a strange thing that God promises throughout Scripture. He requires it, as a matter of fact. Beginning even in the Old Testament, he says uh, that in the law that every, uh, every judgment, everything that, that is said as a witness or as a testimony should be uh, verified by two or more witnesses. There's got to be more than one thing that speaks. This is God's answer uh, for how folks should know the truth. And wouldn't you know that God has been gracious? He has given us more than one testimony within the scriptures if you had only the old testament as the jewish people uh did you can open up a a um a hebrew bible which i i have one if you ever want to look at it it is incredible uh to behold and uh, very difficult to read <laughs> and it says on the cover in hebrew law and prophets that there are two testimonies that are given from the very beginning the testimony of god's law and the testimony of prophecy as Christian people, we believe that God uh, absolutely has given us a, a law, that there's a righteous command, that there's a way of knowing what God wants for us. But there's also this other testimony of the gospel, of God's grace, that there's something more to this, that God doesn't simply make demands of people, but he, but he loves us and he tells us all about this through the testimony of Scripture. And in the world, the world needs to know of Jesus Christ and if the scriptures have been given, but they are not going to be read by people who don't trust it, well, where is their witness? How can they believe? How can they hear of what God has spoken if no one tells them? And how can someone tell them if no one goes? Because the incredible truth it's so hard to believe and it seems much harder even to live out is that God has prepared two witnesses so that the world might know the truth the one through the word and the other through you through his church that what God desires for the world is to be able to verify the truth of what we proclaim by the lives that we live and the word that we share this is what God wants from his people, and he, it's what he wants for his people. That there are two testimonies, the testimony of inward truth, right, and the testimony of outward truth. So in the scriptures, we have God's word. We read this word, and we say, this has the power to change your life. And the world should look at you and go, and they're doing this, by the way. Great, has it changed your life? This has the power to change the world, and you want the world to be different. Great, are you going to change the world? And they are looking at a church who has said, no. That we are part of the testimony of God's work in the world, that our lives are meant to, through both word and through deed to shine forth the truth of what we believe, and more often than not, we have nothing to say. And isn't this the terrible shame? Not that God has failed to provide a witness, to provide a testimony into this world. That God has not failed to love the rest of the world just as he's loved us. For Christ died 2,000 years ago for the sin not just of the church, but of the whole world. That the blood of Jesus Christ covers over every sin. It has forgiven you and set you free. And just as Peter tells us in this reading that we've received this incredible thing, well then all the more should we not be changed by it? Should we not be living in it? Should we not make, as he says, our calling and election sure? That is to say, to prove outwardly to the world that God has indeed done all of the things that he's promised in and for and through each of us. This is the testimony. But who's hearing it? Now, God won't fail. I got a spoiler alert. If you le read to the very back of this book, you go to uh, the Revelation. It's the last book in the Bible, and it's filled with prophecy. Um, it talks about things that have happened. It's talking about, as well, things which are yet to happen. And one of the problems that we have as a church, and I think it's a, one of the problems that uh, shows itself in this way, that we're often looking for something else that God's going to do, 
We're often looking ahead to what God's going to accomplish. We're looking for the one that God's going to send. We're looking for all of the things that God's going to do because whatever this is, it isn't enough. And so we have a kind of a faithless way of hoping in the scriptures. When we look at the revelation, we see that God is not going to fail to provide those multiple witnesses forever. That there's a time coming before Jesus returns. We believe he's coming back, by the way. Spoiler alert. But that he is going to uh, have two witnesses that bear testimony to him. Now, if you don't know much about the Bible, if you haven't read through the balance of it, then you can be forgiven to imagine that, well, I'm looking for a couple of guys, okay? I don't know how tall they're going to be or what their hair color is and how are we going to know when they show up. But uh, these two witnesses are uh, considered to be these folks from the Old Testament. One, Moses prophesies about. Moses says, hey, guess what? There's going to be a prophet who's going to be raised up, and that person is going to be like me in incredible ways, and you should listen to him. Just know that that's coming. Okay? And then there's this other fellow, Elijah. Elijah's taken up to heaven now. Elijah's like the greatest of prophets. He's taken up to heaven without dying. And it's believed that at the end of time that these witnesses are going to be the ones bearing testimony to Jesus. And often in the church, we're looking at it going like, great, can't wait till that happens because I hate talking to people about all this stuff. The problem with it is, is that those witnesses have never stopped speaking, and they're speaking right now. That people look to this prophecy wanting to see the day that's coming so that today isn't that day. But if we read the balance of the scriptures, we should know this about how God speaks about his witness and his testimony. That when God says uh, in his word, he uses the name Moses and Elijah, that these are shorthand for the law and the prophets. That same Hebrew Bible that on the cover says law and prophets, that is Moses and Elijah. Doubt me? Read the words of Jesus Christ in the Gospels, who continuously refers to the law and the prophets, to Moses and Elijah, that God will always have a testimony going out from his church into the world, telling those who don't yet know of Jesus that God is saving them, that God loves them, that he forgives them, that he wants them to be a part of what he's doing, that God has in mind for us more and greater things than even our hearts long for. And when we look at the fallen and and brokenness of this world and we want things to be better, God is even all the more longing for that for you. He doesn't fail to speak that truth into your hearts, even into the emptiness and, and into the void, creating a longing within us so that we would search out and seek out something that had the power to make it better and he never fails to provide that in Jesus. And it is his word that speaks out over time and it speaks today. Why should we want something more to prepare the way of Jesus than what God gave us? To prepare the way of Jesus, which is his word. That we don't need the end of time to begin now bringing Jesus to the people who are lost. The people who Christ died to save. But where is that second witness? Where is the church? I will say this, that we do participate, even silently, in a form of witness that is powerful and important. Because here you are. You gather around the preaching of the word. You gather around the worship of our Lord. You gather around these things. And there are no other books uh, that, that have this kind of power. You can go to the library and no one is worshiping right now uh, in front of John Steinbeck or in front of Dostoyevsky. We gather here around the Holy Word of God because it has brought us together. And it is powerful, this witness. Because by coming together, we're saying, this is worth my time. It's worth a piece of my life. Because it's changed my life. But when we come together, it goes only as far as these walls. And it is no small coincidence that Jesus was crucified outside of the city and outside of the walls so that the whole rest of the world would be able to see into what God was doing by giving his son. That the work of the church is the testimony of Jesus Christ, not in the church, but to the ends of the earth. And friends, that is 
why he has saved you to be that witness to be that testimony and to carry it out from this place I pray that you will do it because God is going to save this world and he's going to do it with or without you but in your life you have a choice you could be a part of the greatest thing that the world has ever known and all you need to do is to bear witness to what God has done for you in Jesus Christ let us pray Father in heaven, um, you will save this world. Lord, don't save it without us. Help us to stop looking beyond for someone else to stand up, for someone else to lead, for someone else to speak, for someone else to go. But you call. Lord, let your people answer. Help us to hear you proclaiming. Help us to hear your command to go and to make disciples, to go and to tell others, to forgive as we have been forgiven. Lord, help us not just to rejoice in the gifts we've been given, but to share those with, to share those gifts with those who, ha they don't have them. In this world, we lament it falls apart, Father. You love it more than we can. But you have made a way for us to participate in, in renewing it and making it better and holding this world together until you heal everything that is broken within it. So Lord, help us to live to participate and to share in your glory by being your witnesses to the ends of this earth. Grant us this, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.